Good evening, everyone. A warm welcome to Sanctity of Life. Every life is precious. Brought to you by Pregnancy Crisis and Support, or PCS in short. We are a program under Catholic Family Life, or CFL in short. We love our acronyms here. I'm Sarah, a volunteer with PCS, and I man the hotline, as well as journey with girls and women with unplanned pregnancies. It is my, indeed my privilege tonight and very excited to welcome our speakers, panelists, and a special guest. Let me introduce you to them. Our speakers tonight are Sister Jacinta Kao and Mr. Darius Lee. We have within our panel um, Andy Wee, Bianca Suarez, and Dr. Alison Snodgrass. And a very warm welcome also to our special invited guests, Mr. Alex Yam. Please uh, warmly welcome them. Thank you. Well, welcome to our young guests. We're very happy to see some young people with these contentious issues. Um, well, they say a picture paints a thousand words. So let me introduce you to PCS by way of this video. Please enjoy. I'm a PCS befriender and a certified counsellor. These women and their families come to us willing to bear their souls and be vulnerable with us. Their stories about their distress, pain and challenges, their courage to seek for help, to find hope and a way to a better life has been a real humbling and inspiring experience for me when I sojourn with these ordinary heroes. PCS collaborates with fostering agencies, shelter services, we work with hospitals, family service centres and SSO. PCS provides uh, before care support um, in the areas of nutrition for the mums to be. And uh, we also have donors who uh, generously donate items like uh, maternity wear and uh, even milk sachets. Uh, and this we are able to offer to our mums to be. Over the years, we have evolved to provide holistic support to our clients. For those who have chosen to abort, we are also here to provide counselling to help them heal and move on in life more effectively. Facing an unwanted or unplanned pregnancy can be an overwhelming experience. Mothers often feel anxiety, stress, guilt, fear, sense of shame and even loneliness. At PCS, we are here to journey with them and offer a listening ear to those in need. We do not judge discriminate or turn away anyone in need. We try to spread love and joy, which we mothers know what joy a newborn baby can bring, even if unplanned. get the technical glitches out of the way first. Um, that's a short introduction to PCS. I hope you enjoyed the video. It is my honour and privilege once again to invite Sister Jacinta Kao as our first speaker. She didn't want us to say very much about her, but this we must say that she belongs to the Franciscan Missionaries of the Divine Motherhood. She has been serving both locally and overseas doing mission work. The fraternity she is in is an inter international religious congregation of Catholic women who proclaim with their lives the joy and freedom of the gospel in the spirit of Francis and Claire of Assisi, sharing the life of their brothers and sisters wherever they go. Sister Jacinta, over to you. Can you hear me? Good evening, everyone, again. Um, I know you've all come from very hectic, active, hectic situations. Some of you have um, been here even serving for quite a while. 
So maybe we can begin by just quieting ourselves. So as I begin this talk, I like to just invite you all to ask yourselves two questions. The first is, what is the root reason for your being alive? What is your root reason that God has called you to life, whatever the patterns of your life has been? And the second is, what precisely is the, of, of your authentic life built on? What precisely is my life authentically built on? Because our hearts and souls need to be built upon the source of our origin. And the source of our origin will be the area in which all our lives will be informed, whether it's physical, psychologically, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. And this is also the most exclusive dimension of who we are. So what is my life built on? What is the most authentic area of my life? And I'd like to invite you all to something that most of you are very familiar with, Psalm 939. Just a short phrase. For thou didst form my inward parts. Thou didst knit me in my mother's womb. I praise thee for thou art fearful and wonderful. And wonderful are all your works. Thou knowest me right well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was being fashioned in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. The psalmist who prayed this prayer is or was an ordinary human being like you and I. We attribute the psalms to King David, but we're not going to do history of the church or psalms, but we actually know that King David's life was very jagged as most of our lives are. But can we really give glory to God and acknowledge that it doesn't matter whether I think my life has been good or bad, God had wanted me from the beginning. And wonderful are his works. So today, as I speak about sanctity of life, um, I like to draw your attention to not just being born is very important, but the whole area that makes up life, because we are not compartments. We're not just, this is my physical. Then if I get that right, oh, that's OK. Then I need a good job. We are really physical, spiritual, emotional, psychological, so every part. And we don't live in a sort of little cocoon. We need to live in relationship with all. So what does relationship with all means? What is this all about? Who is the all in our lives? And the Catholic Church teaches very clearly, I hope you can see, all life is sacred, all life, all life, human ever as otherwise. Both human and all forms of life, all forms of life. God the Creator made everything holy. And at creation, He honored it by saying, this is very good. This is good. This is very good. Everything that he made, God honored it by actually giving his own stamp on it. This is good. What I have made can only be good. He blessed all of creation. Can we go back? Sorry. He blessed all of creation, and then he handed it to us as gift. And the greatest gift which we are now preparing in the season of Advent is the coming of Jesus, the incarnation. He came 2,021 years ago. But long before that even, the people were already expecting someone they knew would come, except they didn't know he would come so humbly. But this incarnation is Jesus tabernacling himself into us. So we have the churches that are 
not fully open. We have to book, and then there are some um, difficulties in having adoration. But we are the tabernacles for Christ. He tabernacled himself within us, okay? So we need to also ask ourselves, when we are tabernacles of Christ, and he gave us the whole of creation, what kind of environment has God intended for us in order that men, women, children, animals, and planet Earth can really live safely and give glory to Him. Take a moment to reflect on our world. And many of us go through life like, I'm very busy about my work, I'm very busy about a job, I'm very busy about my family, I'm very busy, which is very good, but you know the world somehow will run on its own. Um, there will be something happening, but now we are actually facing crisis global crisis, global warming, and a lot more other things, the floods and, all, and everything that happens in the world must touch us because we are not some, oh, as long as I'm okay, don't worry about it. When God created the world, he made us one in him. He tabernacled himself in us. He is in you, he is in me, we are all one. We know that in theory, but we need to sometimes really come down to really sit with it and let it speak to our hearts. Now, every person and creature, that would be animals, trees, plants, rock formation, minerals in the earth, is the object of the Father's tenderness who gives its, it its place in the world. This is Pope Francis in Laudato Si. And he is very clear, he said, even the fleeting life of the least of beings is the object of his love. The least, the smallest. That's why St. Francis won't even kill an ant. Now, I'm not that far, I'm not like that, but, but you know, he, he, for those who really can, can absorb them into their lives, they would see it. this is all of God's creation, it is sacred. And I'm handing the life of sacredness to my generations after me. And in the few seconds of even these very um, small objects, of life, butterflies, of however uh, short their existence, God has already enfolded it with his affection. So God is goodness without measure. His love moves the sun and the stars. In Jesus' incarnation, we can ascend to the greatness of God and to his loving mercy. If we can recognize that incarnation is in all of us, we really are already moving, ascending to God. And we need to be very sure of that and not just think of some romantic stuff that the Pope is writing, okay? Now, the Catholic Catechism teaches one thing, although we are the submit of God's creation, we are the imago Dei, the image of God. God also created everything. He God's gift of understanding and will was that man and woman can decide for or against love. We have the free will. We are very powerful human beings. We can choose no matter what our circumstances are, we can make the choice. It can be very challenging to make the right choices, yes, but we are called for a purpose. Men and women must honour the Creator in other creatures and treat them carefully and responsibly. All life, men, women, children, animals, plants, have the same creator who called them into being out of love. If I have a child but I create a chaos in my world and environment, how can that child grow? But the answer is not, Allah, in that case, don't have lah. If I have, then get rid of it. Okay? Now, I love Chief Seattle. If you have time, uh, do Google him. He was a chief who spoke in 1854 to the big man, white man he calls in Washington. Of all the long dissertation he gave, this is one thing that is really very beautiful. Remember, whatever befalls the earth, befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. We did not weep, weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. What we do with the web we do to ourselves. And if I spit on the earth, I also am spitting on myself. OK? 
Okay, so he he's uh, I, I really loved his his writings. Okay. Okay. Now so when God created the universe, he saw that it was really very good. Human beings are the submit, truly we are the Imago Dei, but everything else is the Manus Dei, the hand of God is in everything else. We are the image, but everything, living creatures are the hand of God, the imprint of God is there. Okay, And he saw that it was very good. Now we're going to talk then about the summit of creation, which is human beings. From the time the, when there's fertilization, conception has already taken place, okay? When the time the ovum is fertilized, a life has already begun, which is neither that of the father or mother. Yes, the parents have come together in the beautiful act of intimacy, and from there, there is now this child, this life. But Pope John Paul says it's not just oh, the father's side and the mother's side. This life is rather a new human being with its own growth. Modern genetics and science of offers clear confirmation, and it has demonstrated that from the first instant, there is established the program of what is this living being. This living being will be a person, not just some vague, it, it, it's a person. So this is Pope John Paul's teaching on Evangelium Vitae. Okay. Now we look a little bit at conception to birth. I do ask you to excuse me. I know I'm facing some eminent doctors and you know so on and so forth. And what I'm saying is nothing new, but it's just a revision then. So we look at really what the stages are. The miracle of growth in the mother's womb.
just take a few moments just to reflect that once upon a time, this was each of you. Whatever our family situation, we were wanted by God. So, what does God say? Thus says the Lord who made you. Your parents came together and gave you life, but I made you. This is very clear. I formed you. This is what God is saying. From the womb, and I will help you. Whatever your circumstances, I will be there. I will help you. Wanted pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. We are all consecrated. Whatever my faith, the fact that I have life, it's yes, from my parents, but who gave that life? And I have been consecrated. You have been consecrated. Made holy. So, now, what have we done? And what are we doing to his creation? Especially in the life of the unborn throughout the centuries and more urgently in the modern age where everything is fast. Don't want, dispose. Laptop, don't want, dispose. Mobile phones, two years old, don't want, dispose. And something inconvenient, don't want, dispose. But it's not, I, I'm not saying this insensitively. I know coming to certain decisions can be very painful. But generally speaking, what have we done to the life around us and life of unborn. This child, any child, is from the Spirit of God who breathed life into each at, at creation. Jesus became flesh through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a gift from God because he's I who formed you from the womb. Now, those of us in, the visita um, in Luke's Gospel, in the visitation of Mother Mary to Elizabeth, we hear when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, she's told Mary, the child in my womb leapt for joy. So even in utero, that, is the, that fetus it is capable, and we know that from modern science, of sensing whether it's wanted or not wanted, sensing emotions of the environment, especially of the mother, sensing the negative spirit or the welcome in the mother's womb. So there is that already. The child is from the Spirit of God, yes, and every birth, therefore, is incarnational. Every birth is divine. It is genuinely, really sacred. So think about this word, incarnation. This is from Daniel O'Leary, a former, uh, a late Daniel O'Leary, a very, um, a priest from Leeds Diocese in, in Liverpool. He wrote a lot about the incarnation, the, the, the absolutely, we are so important that Jesus in the end wants to also take the human form and be amongst us. Okay. But my brothers and sisters, the reality too, if this is true, as indeed it is, we need to ask ourselves why were there in the first 10 days of 2001 in Singapore, an estimated, oh no, in the world, sorry, 1.2 million abortions worldwide. Just the first 10 days of 2001. 1.2 million abortions. This works out to be about 40, 50 million abortions performed worldwide each year, and it's around roughly 125,000 abortions every day. Okay. Now, we have a saying in Africa, but you've also conned that saying in the, as we are living in a globalized world. The Africans would say it takes a village to look after a child and for a child to grow. So yes, the parents have the actual um, right and the authority given by God, but everyone is actually involved in bringing a child to its fullness of life. So all of us have the duty and responsibility to protect innocent human life. It is also one of the noblest tasks of the state 
and our Catholic Catechism also says, if a state, I'm not pointing fingers because we have to be very polit politically correct, but if any state evades the responsibility, it undermines the very foundations of the rule of law. And we are part of the state. We are part of everything. Okay. Now, I, I, when it comes to abortion, I'm not going to be like, you know, well, they shouldn't do it and off, because there are myriad of reasons, myriads, and, and very often it's extremely difficult and extremely emotive. However, I also have to say I've met people who are a little bit la -di da about it, because, well, look, sister, I'm, oh, they didn't know I'm a sister, so that was a good thing, yes. Um, it, I'm just not ready. It was an accident. What are the things that often come to minds of people and what they have heard and the pressures that they undergo? You have destroyed your life and your future by becoming pregnant. How are you going to care for this baby? Very common. And it's true, there are, how am I going to care for the baby? So these half-truths, we must be very careful because there's truth and there's half-truth. What will other people say? Ayo, this one is very big. I think big, 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 big time in Singapore because we're very kiasu. Eh? What will other people say? Alamak, your pal, your, your relatives, your neighbors, ayo. Uh, what will other people say? What will our relatives say? You have disgraced us. You brought shame upon us. How could you do this? So, if you are pregnant and you know this is your, the support you're going to get, it seems, in that deep emotional state, very hard to find a clear thinking pattern and solution. Also, we cannot afford to feed this child. I'm not ready. I have my studies, and my career to think of. This was an accident. I don't know how it happened. Very common also. The guy concerned said it has nothing to do with him, so I cannot bring this child into the world with no father, who is going to support us? That is also very common. And this one said to me, it's not yet a baby, just a clump of cells. We just have, we have the right as women to decide what to do with our bodies. It's my body, my decision. Thank you. So. Now, we come to another part of the reasons for abortion. And this is extremely emotive, and it is a heinous crime. Because I worked in places where, oof, it's, it's, so what? She's a woman. And um, rape. And also, human trafficking is one of the most heinous crimes. And the women that have been systematically raped, sometimes seven or eight times a day, to, to support the, the luxuries of the pimps. Let us not forget the horrors of rape. It is true, it's happening far too frequently. We need to approach this with great compassion and respect. It is our responsibility to be au fait with what the church teaches about rape. And this is a topic in itself, and we don't have time to go through it, but basically we need to know this. Rape is really deeply wounds. It, it, penetrates and it absolutely breaks the respect and freedom and physical and moral integrity to which every person has a right, especially, of course, the women. But even men have been raped. Young men have been raped too. So it's not just women, but much more common women. It causes grave damage to the psyche, can mark the victim for life. It's always intrinsically evil. We cannot say, ayah, poor thing, the man, the, the woman doesn't know what he, she is doing. Graver still is the rape of children, which is extremely tragic and very, very, very painful and real trauma. And especially if it's committed by parents or those responsible for the care and education of the children and trusted to them. We all know that, so it's nothing new what, that I'm saying. So what, is, what, what does the church say? Now, four aspects of rape that we need to take into consideration. It's ethical and religious directives from the Catholic health care. First, the person must receive spiritual and psychological support and counselling to help the, her, we presume is her, there are also, also he's, and I've dealt with he's as well, deal with this trauma. 
this might be ongoing for some time because there will be real post-traumatic stress coming back over and over again. Healthcare must providers need to cooperate with the law enforcement officers to gather information for the protection of the rapists. This can be very difficult because especially it's from the family, there's a lot of hush-hush and sometimes these people are threatened, especially in certain cultures in certain countries. The person needs medical treatment, definitely, for bruises, for cuts and other injuries. Treatment also to prevent the possible contact of venereal disease and HIV. And the fourth, the directive states, a woman who has been raped may defend herself against a conception resulting from sexual assault. But be careful what the next sentence says. If after appropriate testing, there is no evidence that conception has occurred, because it takes about 24 hours, she may be treated with medication that would prevent, prevent ovulation, sperm capacitation, the sperm um, dividing, or fertilization. However, it is not permissible to recommend treatments that directly affect the removal, destruction, or interference with the implantation of the already fertilized ovum. So there has to be a lot of support surrounding this person and a lot of compassion, a lot of understanding. And even if they take out the anger on you, we need to be the receptacle for it. Okay? Now, we go to the practical steps. What can each of us do to promote sanctity of life? First, very easy. Well, maybe not so easy, but pray intentionally for the understanding of how sacred life is that each one can do. Second, the best way to really make sure something really happens is to touch the children because they are like sponge absorbing things. And if they hear good and see good, there is an implantation in their minds. Even if later on they leave the church or whatever, something will lead them back because they have already had some grounding. So educate our children about responsibility towards sacredness of all life in all its aspects. If they learn that, they will also see that human life is very sacred. We must also help children think about what it means to be deprived of life. Maybe suggest, do something practical if you have family or grandchildren or nieces or godchildren. Class, if you're a teacher, practical. Like, suggest putting a few coins aside or do something together according to financial means, creative means to support unborn the unborn and other forms of charity so that a child from young already starts to get their minds around. You know, there are others worse off than me. Don't wait until they demand something like an expensive phone then you start telling them, there are people worse than you. You write around. It's just that from very young they learn that my mind is attuned to other people. Model what we teach. Do we say life is sacred? and then condone other forms of cruelty that they can see. Don't talk to that person. Leave that person because you know what? They come from family you don't want to know. Uh, well, there's a cat. Get it out of the way. They, they must see. Sometimes we talk, but we, we talk the talk, but we don't walk the talk. Have open discussions according to age and understanding of our children regarding san sanctity of life. And you'd be amazed how children can be, future, can be prophetic people for us, the, out of the mouth of babes. Be practical about how we can walk the talk. Yeah. And then they need to witness how's the spousal relationship. I need to see what my father and mother are like. If every day flying cups and saucers and plates around, what is the sanctity of life? Pope Francis did say, you may fly, fly cups and saucers in... Uh, husbands and wives, but for goodness sake, before you go to bed, let there be reconciliation. Let the children be able to witness, I'm sorry, we reconcile. So they learn that also, that life is not always honeycomb, but when we have fractures, we will also have rebonding. Some 
internet material can be wonderful, but some of them, and many in fact, are extremely harmful. And this is very difficult, I know, because when your children are of a certain age, you don't know what they're watching. But there must be ways from young when you can make sure when you start young to moderate and, and make sure that you are actually the parents, you have the authority to know what they are watching and what you will allow and what you will not allow. Uh, it's also good to help them understand global issues, sign global petitions regarding sanctity of life in all its forms, be a participant, not a bystander. So no matter the scars or limitations, every child is precious. And I'm sure I'm addressing people sitting here who have scars in their lives too. But we have choices and we can make that choice. And remember, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. So don't say, it's too difficult, you don't understand, it's all right for you, you're a sister, you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Come and tell, see me, I'll tell you a few stories, okay? We face many challenges, yes, we do, yes. But remember what God said from in Isaiah. Thus says the Lord who made you and who formed you, and who will help you. Sometimes we do things, this is so difficult, I cannot, this, I cannot, I, 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 there's nobody. We forget that there is one who says, I will help you. We can rely on that. If we really are crying out to God, I, I, I can promise you this, he will send help. And we need to open and be ready to receive the help. So, God who created us asks us to remain his co-creators. And if we feel the task is too daunting, his words are, I will help you. Okay? Now, let us begin again. This is to bring to birth what we would like our children to inherit. And finally, I'd like us to look at this poem. And let's read it together, shall we? Okay, start. No, dear, they said. What? Thank you very much, Sister Jacinta, for the very insightful talk and certainly leaving us a lot of room for reflection. Um, I ask that you keep those thoughts in your mind as we're having a Q&A uh, session later with our panelists and after our second speaker, whom I will bring up right now, um, I warmly welcome Darius Lee. He holds a Master's of International Law and Human Rights from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He advocates for religious freedom, marriage, and the sanctity of human life, and has contributed actively in public forums, as well as his blog, I, on Singapore. He has also published a number of peer-reviewed articles in academic journals on various issues in international and domestic law. Please welcome Darius. Right, thank you. So I'm going to talk about something of a slightly different nature, and I'm going to focus more on the philosophical and ethical perspectives on the sanctity of life. So let's begin with a couple of philosophical questions. I think when you talk about the issue like abortion, essentially you're asking two questions. The first question is, what does it mean to be human? And the second question is, what does it mean to be humane? 
And I think whenever you talk about the issue of abortion, you always come back to these big, deep, philosophical questions that touch something very, very core to all of us as human beings. So let's move on. Now, talk about human nature. What does it mean to be human? And well, as you have seen from the video earlier, as well as from what Sister Jacinta shared, if you think about human reproduction, as human beings, we are biologically male and female. And of course, during sexual intercourse, the man's sperm fertilizes the woman's egg. Okay, and so from the point of conception on, you can see that the human being, the fertilized egg, has a complete and unique human DNA. Sex, body type, eye, and hair color, facial characteristics, etc., etc., are all determined from that point of conception. And the development of that fertilized egg is just a smooth and unbroken continuum throughout. It's not as if at a particular point you can see a sudden break, it changes into a different creature altogether. So again, as you've seen from the video earlier, I think that illustrates it very, very well. So if you think about it, if you ask biologists, almost all biologists would say, yes, human life begins at conception. And this was actually the result of a survey that was done of biologists, right? So this was done in the United States. And well, yes, 95% actually agreed. The other 5%, well, they didn't really want to answer or they just responded and said, hey, look, are you asking something political or something like that? And in fact, that study noted that many of them were themselves liberal on abortion. So what they were actually saying was that, yes, I agree that human life begins at conception, but nevertheless, I still support abortion. Why? Let's move on. We'll get to that soon, but if you think about the nature of a human being, we are all an integrated unity of heart, soul, mind, and body, right? So that's the emotional, that's the spiritual, that's the intellectual, and the physical aspects of the human being. And we're all all of these things at once. It is not as if my body is something separate from me, but it is part of me. So if you think about it, where is the intellectual disagreement here? People do agree, yes, human life begins at conception. But what they would say, and what you would probably encounter more often if you talk to somebody who supports abortion, is that they'll say, well, yes, I agree. Fetuses are human, but they're not persons. And what are they actually talking about? Now, if you go into dialogue with them, you probably find that they boil it down to something called the SLED, the SLED test. So they would probably say something like this. Well, fetuses are small. They are at an early stage of development. They are located in the womb and they are dependent on their mothers and cannot survive on their own. So let's break one one of these uh, reasons down one by one, all right? So look at the idea of size. If people are saying, well, they're small, think about it. Do we judge people because of their size? So someone who is very tall and very big is worth much more than somebody who is perhaps small size? Or what about somebody because of some physical disabilities that they're born with that they cannot grow very tall? Does that mean that as a result, they're worth any less? Again, is size a good basis to say that people are not worth respecting, that they're not persons because they're small? You can see that it's not a very good reason, right? Moving on, level of development. So some people would say that, well, they are not very well developed. Perhaps they don't have enough um, intellectual capacity. Perhaps they cannot feel pain and so on and so forth. But again, if you look at the continuum, do we judge people again? because that, well, they are just young, they're small, they're underdeveloped. Or perhaps, again, if you think about the idea of people who may have developmental disabilities, do we say that these people are worth less? And so, again, you can see that this is something which we shouldn't be judging people because they are less, quote unquote, developed than us. Moving on, what about environment? And so I put two pictures up there. So imagine if you were swimming underwater, or imagine if you were an astronaut out in space. 
are you worth any less than a human being who is standing on land, who is here on Earth? Well, you would say that, again, the astronaut in space, yes, different environment in a space which is very different from whatever we have. No, don't have breathable air under the sea. Again, you cannot breathe under the sea. I don't think any of us can, but would you say that they are worth any less? Once again, the answer is probably no. Moving on. And finally, dependency. And this ties back to something very, very deep and profound. Because if you think about dependency, as human beings, aren't we all actually dependent on each other? Aren't we all actually dependent on our environment, on the world that we live in? Something that we have seen discussed by Sister Jacinta earlier. We are all dependent on one another. None of us can actually say, okay, well, I don't need to depend on anybody at any point in my life. I can basically live alone completely. We were all vulnerable at some point. We were all babies at some point. We had to rely on our mothers to take care of us. Or that astronaut, once again, he is dependent on, of course, his life support system. He's dependent on his colleagues back at the space station to make sure that they don't, you know, let's say, accidentally fly off, cut off the rope that's, you know, tying him back to the spaceship and so on and so forth, right? So again, are these people worth any less? Again, the answer is no. So if you think about it, the pro-life position is basically one about equality. We're basically saying that all human beings are equal, regardless of size, level of development, location, or condition of dependency. Now, let's move on to that. And I think this comes to the question of our local context. So let's unpack this a little bit. So abortion in Singapore, it's permitted up to 24 weeks, and after 24 weeks, it's permissible only if, quote, it is immediately necessary to save the life or to prevent grave permanent injury to the physical or mental health of the pregnant woman. If you are under age, whether it's 16 or 18, depending on how you want to count it, you don't need to get your parents' consent to get an abortion, okay? So Singapore's laws are actually very, very liberal on this front. So rewind the clock a little bit. How did abortion become liberalized in Singapore? 1969. So back in 1969, there was a huge debate in Parliament because the abortion bill was laid before Parliament. Before that, abortion was only legal if it was done in good faith to save the life of the pregnant woman. So if the woman's life was in danger, then that was the only basis for abortion. But then, of course, they wanted to push the idea to liberalize abortion and what's interesting is this. Very often you've heard the idea that abortion is a woman's right. Very often you've heard the idea that women somehow pushed for the legalization of abortion. But notice that there was only one woman in parliament at that time, back in 1969. Her name was Chan Choi Seong. Moving on. So what was the government concerned about? Well, they were concerned about what they called back alley abortions. People were having illegal abortions. And so what the government said was, we want to correct some legal ambiguities by stating in clear terms the medical conditions under which you can perform abortions. And they said, we want to promote the well-being of the woman and to avoid impairment of her health in the interest of humanity and human progress. So I mentioned that there was only one woman in parliament at that time, right? What did she say about abortion? She said this, and very, very strong words that you see there. Legalization of abortion is tantamount to murder, but it is not a direct form of murder. It is an indirect form of murder. She also said, our women will suffer a great deal more if the abortion bill is passed. And she actually voted against the legalization of abortion. So again, I just want to highlight one point is that many people think that women somehow got together and pushed to legalize abortion. In Singapore, that was not the story. The story was that the people who voted to legalize abortion were men, whereas the only woman in parliament voted against it. 1974, the abortion bill came up for review again. There were actually no women in parliament at that time, and our abortion law is more or less the same as back in 1974. 
Next slide. So 2018, um, the Ministry of Health actually explained why parental consent is not required for minors, underage people who are seeking abortion, and they said this. They are concerned, why? Because mandating parental consent for such abortions may compel these minors to risk their lives by seeking unsafe abortion. Let me explain what their reasoning is, okay? So basically they're saying that if we put in place this requirement that, okay, let's say you are a 16 year old girl and if you want to get an abortion, you need to go and ask your parents. What these 16 year olds may do is that they may go to illegal abortion places and they'll seek unsafe abortions or something like they will try to abort by themselves and therefore they risk their own life and health. So right now, unmarried minors below 16 are required to undergo compulsory pre-abortion counselling at the Health Promotion Board Counselling Centre. Next slide. So very thankful for Mr Alex Yam to join us today. And this is what he asked Parliament um, two years ago. This was not the first time he did so. And he asked whether the Health Ministry will consider adjusting the threshold of gestational age for abortion from 24 weeks to 22 weeks based on increasing viability of even extreme preterm babies. Let me explain what Mr. Yam was thinking and I think he can elaborate more in his time. But basically, if you think about it, 1974, they said 24 weeks is a cutoff for abortion. And that was based on the medical technology at that time. 1974 to 2021 or 2019, for example, how many years is that? And what's the state of medical technology? So if you read some recent news reports, you really see reports of preterm children being born at 22 weeks. Some maybe even slightly before that. So the medical technology has improved to such a point. Next stage. Yeah. So, Senior Minister of State for Health, Dr. Amy Kaur, replied that this will be kept. Why? Because fetal viability below 24 weeks remains low. Morbidities such as neurodevelopmental disabilities are very high among the premature babies who survived. And for Dawn, and she also added that about 1% of all abortions performed were performed between 22 and 24 weeks of which more than half of these abortions were performed due to fetal abnormalities and other medical reasons. Now, just pause here very quickly. Remember what we took you through about the SLED test, right? And remember we talked about how we're talking about equality. You can see here that there is a bit of reasoning here that is a little bit problematic because it's telling us not just that unborn children are worth less, but it's also telling us something about disabled people, right? That if you are having any fetal anomalies, well, to a certain extent, your abortion is justified. And I think that is a fairly common perspective among Singaporeans, especially if you talk to them. So let's move on to the next slide. So if you look at the statistics of abortion, you would Note that actually the number of abortions has fallen quite significantly, almost half if you compare back in 2008, 2009, all the way to 2019. So the statistics show that abortions have been falling, but is it because people are more and more pro-life? I think not. So a survey was conducted among 19-year-olds, and I can see many young people here, that's a good thing. So 2019, they surveyed 19-year-olds and 51% disagreed or strongly disagreed with the idea that the law allowing abortion should be abolished. 31% are neutral and 18% agreed or strongly agreed. Moving on. If you look at perspectives on abortion, if you look among Catholics, you can see that Older Catholics tend to be more conservative on abortion, but if you look at the age group between 18 to 35 years old, you would see that for those people who say that abortion is always wrong, if the family has a very low income and cannot afford any more children, only 8% of Catholics aged between 18 to 35 years old say that abortion in that case is always wrong. Now, I want you to think about this. If they say that abortion in that case is generally okay, what do you think they are saying about everything else? 
rape, or let's say if the child is diagnosed with fetal anomalies and things like that, what do you think? So for the young people around here, I believe that perhaps you might encounter some of your friends who have views like these. And I'm sure that you might even encounter in church people who have views like these. And I think that's the environment that you live in. So let's move on. So this was a very recent survey. Again, this is a little bit vague, big picture. So if you look at big picture survey, the number of people who say that abortion is never or seldom justifiable was actually quite high. But again, I think this particular survey is a bit broad brush, a bit too general. It doesn't look at the specifics enough because what we've seen from earlier surveys is that people have quite liberal views on abortion. So let's move on. So what to understand about our Singapore context? Well, we live in a multiracial and multi-religious society, but most Singaporeans, I would think, are generally quite pragmatic on the issue of abortion. So for example, many believe that abortion is permissible if the family has a very low income and cannot afford any more children. And well, people would say that, well, you know, abortion should be legal because there is this risk of back alley abortions. And as I mentioned, young people tend to be increasingly liberal on the issue of abortion. Let's move on. So let's talk about how we can build a culture of life. And I think there are many things we could possibly do, but let's reflect on this little story here. So in the year 1987, there was this Oxford postgraduate student. His name was Robert Carver. His ex-girlfriend was 18 weeks pregnant and she wanted an abortion. This young man, he tried to persuade her to change her mind, to stop the abortion, but when she refused to change her mind, he said, okay, I have no choice, I have to try to apply to court to stop her from getting an abortion. So that case went all the way up to the highest court in the United Kingdom and Robert Carver failed. Basically, the court said, you have no chance of success. Abortion is for the woman to decide. You, as a man, have no right to say anything. And yet, there is a little bit of an aftermath to this story. Everybody generally knows the first part of this story. But then, subsequently, the young woman actually changed her mind. She told young Robert Carver, you know, sure. I will give birth to this child, but on this condition, you must take care of the child and it's no longer my business. And he said, yes, sure, I'll do it. And so that's a bit of a good news, you know, as a result of this story. And it gives us a lot of points to reflect on. If you think about it, when you think about the issue of abortion, it is not just quote unquote, a woman's issue. It is an issue for all human beings. And so if you think about this issue of abortion, to build this culture of life, we must understand that both men and women have rights and responsibilities towards one another, as well as towards children, and that both men and women suffer from the consequences of abortion. So I'm sure some of you would know about people or of people who have had abortions before. And what I want you to understand is that men suffer too. And I think this case of Robert Carver, of course, ended well, but there are many people, many men, many women for whom the story did not. So I like this quote. I didn't come up with it. Um, it's by the Feminist for Life. They say that every abortion is a sign that the needs of women and children are not met. So if you think about the issue of abortion, I used to be quite critical of this idea of, you know, well, if you try to ban abortions, it will result in quote-unquote back alley abortions. I used to be quite critical of this perspective. But over time, I sort of began to understand a little bit more. I want you to understand this. You see, if the government were to pass a law to just ban abortion today, what do you think will happen? Do you think society will become pro-life naturally tomorrow? Do you think all abortions will stop tomorrow? I think in the hearts and minds of people, it still hasn't changed. So, you see, more than actually making abortion illegal, you need to make abortion unthinkable. You need to change people's hearts and minds. 
to help them appreciate the sanctity of life from womb to tomb. So that is what we need to do in our culture, in our society today. So I'm going to reflect on some mistakes I made when I used to start on the issue of abortion. So just to share a little bit. Now, this was a conversation on Facebook on the issue of abortion, and this was many years ago. Perhaps not too many, but there we are. So this lady, Miss X, she said this on Facebook. In this whole discussion, has anyone considered the pain of the mother who had to abort her child because of fatal complications that a continued pregnancy would bring? It is so easy to say abortion is wrong and evil and to speak up against it. But in this fallen world, even something like abortion has its role to play. Of course, the mother could have chosen the option of praying for healing and continuing the pregnancy by faith. But honestly, who are we to judge? What did I write? I wrote this on Facebook, and I said, I understand you're speaking about fetal abnormality. Yes, I've considered it, but are we then saying that a human being who is abnormal or deformed is any less a human being? On the other hand, if the life of the mother is at stake, then abortion is permissible as a matter of necessity. This is the position in Ireland and the position I hold to. And who am I to judge? I'm nobody, but God says it is wrong to kill. So this conversation was before Ireland changed its laws back in 2018. Um, Ireland has since become quite liberal on abortion. Now, next slide. So if you think about my little exchange, well, what do you say about what I wrote? Well, theologically and theoretically possibly correct, but was it cold and uncaring? Was it insensitive, too combative? I think you can say all of those things. And in fact, perhaps something I missed was this. Could Miss X have been speaking from her own personal experience? And so what I think from this little experience and this little mistake that I made, of course, how we dialogue on the issue of abortion is important. And I think what I used to think was that in order to persuade people, you had to present a lot of intellectual arguments and reasons. But what I realize now is that it's important, if not actually more important, to build relationships, to listen, especially in an Asian culture like ours. So here are some little tips as to how to dialogue on the issue of abortion. Empathize with the person. And what's empathy? Essentially, it's about learning to see the world through the person's eyes. Be genuinely curious to understand where the person is coming from. Listen without judgment. Listen to what this person is saying and try to understand that person's perspective. Avoid the temptation to shame and condemn because the moment you start saying, okay, this is wrong, this is bad, and everything like that, well, it tends to make people more defensive and confrontational and you may end up damaging the relationship or even driving people away towards more extreme views. Next. So listen deeply. <coughs> listen, understand the source of this disagreement. Is this person speaking from a particular religious or philosophical worldview? Could there be personal or emotional reasons behind this disagreement? Right? So Miss X that I was talking about, could she have had an abortion herself? So there we are. Try to understand that person for who he or she is. That is a profound affirmation of that person's dignity. So be against bad ideas, but not against people. And disagree rigorously with their ideas. That's fine. But treat people who disagree with you with civility and respect. So what I want all of us to understand is you may think of yourself pro-life, pro-choice, pro-abortion, anti-abortion, things like that. But what I want you to understand is it's not a case of us, the good guys, versus them, the bad guys, right? But it's basically different perspectives, different perspectives about human nature, human identity, relationships, communities, laws, and policies. And disagreement is not hate. Those who disagree with you are not your enemies. I like this quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. And I think that is a profound truth 
that is spoken. So some other points. Now, in dialogue, when you talk to somebody, never make it your goal to convince the person on the spot. I think everyone has probably met a very pushy insurance salesman, right? And you know how irritating it is? You know how all the more that this person is trying to push something on you, all the more you're going to walk away and say no, right? So that is probably how you're going to be like if you're going to try to convince a person on the spot. So don't do that. Instead, what you should do is to actually talk to that person, right? Get to know the person. So if you see, especially in our Asian culture, generally people don't like to feel ashamed, don't like to feel that they're wrong or embarrassed or anything like that. So give that person space to express, express himself or herself, explain his or her perspective and so on. So aim to build long-term relationships, engage in deep conversations and sow seeds of truth that will grow in time and let it grow. So next. So I like this old saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So there we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darius, for the, another very insightful and thought-provoking talk. Um, we now have the uh, open, uh, open discussion. Uh, may I invite the panelists and the speakers up? and give us a few minutes to set ourselves up. We'll throw open the, the mic to the floor now. So um, anybody who'd like to speak, uh, just raise your hand. Uh, you can use my mic since the floating mic is not working too well. My apologies, let me introduce my panel. <laughs> okay, on that side, you know Darius and sister, so I introduce from that side. That's uh, Dr. Alison Snodgrass. She's uh, practicing uh, medicine in Singapore for many years. She is a pediatrician uh, with a public hospital, and uh, she's also a board member of Catholic Family Life. We have uh, Bianca Suarez. She represents uh, Life Runners, and they do a weekly uh, prayer rosary and walk at uh, two parks in Singapore. And we have uh, Andy Wee. Right, he is uh, Andy is a vice president of uh, national natural family planning and also teaches couples on the use of the Billings evolution method um, to um, to regulate their their birth controls. Yeah, so he's also a part of the Life Runners group who meets uh, regularly for the pro life rosary as well. Please welcome them. Um, yes, uh, off to the floor. Anybody with some questions, please do, uh, do raise them. Or if not, I'll, break, I'll start uh, with uh, some thought-provoking ones that the, the speakers have come up with. So Sister Jacinta mentioned about conception brought about by victims of rape, and more so if they are children raped by family members. How does compassion even help if these victims do not understand what is happening to their bodies, especially if they are children, and if they cannot stand the sight of carrying the perpetuator's ba baby in their bodies, what if the thought of seeing the babies lead them to even suicidal tendencies and lifetime emotional scarring? Sorry to put you in this position, sister, but maybe you could help us with address such questions. There are no quick, simple solutions to that. What is very important for any victim of rape is that they are believed. We must validate what they say. Because very often, especially if it's from family members, um, there's a lot of denial. 
and the victim begins to feel shame and so on. Um, uh, we've said a lot of support. The victims sometimes have to be removed from the situation where this is happening, especially if it's a constant perpetuation of this um, heinous crime, I would call it. I don't want to judge the persons doing it, but we cannot down, water down what is done to children. It, it's, 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 you know, you, you, we have no idea until you see what it really does to their whole psyche and you know this is for life. So they need a lot of support and a lot of help to know this is not their fault. It will take a long time. But also to provide every service that they will need and that is when they are pregnant, um, there are services that are available. There's a lot of counselling and childcare to go through, or teenage care, especially depending on their, their age group, um, and to help them to see that what they have gone through. And if abortion is like, I don't want this baby, I don't want... You can understand why they feel that way. But there will be other alternatives for this baby, who is also an innocent victim, as the parents are, as the mother is. And OK, I, I didn't want a lot of what I did and to be introduced. But for a while, when I was in England, I worked in the Madai Trust, which is um, a place, safe houses given by religious uh, who have shrunk in community. And the big houses are handed over. And I see some of you nodding, so you understand that and it's given for human trafficked people. And many of them are rescued or they've managed to run away and they have come from every other country that you can think of and many of them are pregnant. And you can see that they, because it's a Catholic organisation, we are not like saying, oh, you poor thing, let's get rid of the baby and that's all is well. We really walk with them through a lot of their psychological pain. And then we encourage them to think of what the stages of growth is like in their child and what they are carrying and what it is that they are doing for this innocent life. And that there are all the agencies ready to be there for them to adopt the child, to find homes. And quite surprisingly, some of them actually says, no, I don't want my child uh, to be given up. Even when, you know, so on. So of course, we observe as well to see how they would bond with a child. And they do, ha I mean, most of them have uh, are on antidepressants. They have to be on, and they, most of them are on sleeping tablets because they have terrible post-traumatic stress. But I remember this very clearly when I said to one woman, beautiful baby, and I was, in the stage now, we kind of got on together, and I was teasing her. I said, it's such a beautiful baby, I'm going to take the baby home with me. And she said to me, no, sister, it's the only, only person I have in my life for me. So it can be done, but it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of empathy, it takes a lot of understanding and validation. And there must be very strong social supports around them. So that's how I would answer that question. Thank you, Sister. Anyone from the floor would like to um, ask a question? If not, maybe we could invite Dr. Ellison to maybe give a medical pers perspective, like for doctors and nurses who are involved in um, performing abortions, uh, what um, medical ethics do, they ha do we have in Singapore on that? Can you hear me? Okay, I am not an expert. So the bioethics book there was compiled uh, under the guidance of uh, Father David Garcia, who is a moral theologian. So um, just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, if you all don't mind, actually, maybe I could share my experiences with you. Not, not so much as, you know, ju just, just a sharing. Okay, so from the start of life, right? I mean, in medical school, you learn about embryology. So the first thing you learn is that the human being, I mean, once the sperm meets the egg, that's a human being. You know, the, as, as the baby grows, I mean, you can see the baby. I have uh, three kids. So um, you know when they do that ultrasound in the womb? So even before you can 
actually feel anything. I mean, you can see the heart, you know. Um, the organ development, we learn in embryology, it takes place, it's continuous. La. So usually the first three weeks, most of the, the major organs are formed. Um, so if you look at the pictures, like just now, which uh, sister showed, it, it actually looks a lot like that. Um, so you, so I'm a pediatrician. So I see these babies, of course, uh, after they're born. But in pediatric training, we have to do a section on neonatology, which involves uh, working with unborn babies. So we usually try to prepare, um, especially for high-risk pregnancies, we try to prepare the setup so that we are all on hand to resuscitate the baby. So in, in cases like this, what we, call, we used to call borderline viability, I mean, Darius is right. Lah. Nowadays, uh, viability, I, I think, is not. It will just continue to get, you know, the medical science will just continue to save more and more. So, I mean, I, I, that, that itself, uh, I, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to even try and answer that question. But we have to, I mean, we talk to parents who are in premature labor, the mums. You know, the, the feeling of, like, they're scared. Lah. I mean, your baby was supposed to, <laughs> come out like at 40 weeks, right? I mean, now the, the labor is starting at 23 weeks. I mean, like, the, imagine how the parents feel, right? Okay, so then uh, we come to the baby being born, right? So in obstetrics and gynecology training, which we all undergo, you have to deliver babies. So it's a certain number of babies. Yeah, so yeah, for those of you who have not given birth or <laughs> have no kids, right? So the birth process is amazing and messy and, you know, um, so it's kind of, I mean, the baby from the womb to the, to being born, it's, I mean, it's the same baby, like, you know, it's just like where you are at this point in time. So like Darius was saying, I mean, the environment doesn't change the nature of the thing. I mean, the baby is still the baby. So baby comes out and doesn't cry, there's an emergency. Cries and you're usually very happy. So then uh, this baby from being an infant as they grow, I mean, I'm a pediatrician, so we see child development. So I mean, yeah, obviously, I was, I was laughing when you, <laughs> when you showed that slide about like the stage of development, because honestly, right, I mean, do any of you have a, like a six month old, an 18 month old, who's, I mean, <laughs> of course they're dependent, uh, you, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and who would say a two year old is like, Cognitively, I mean, you know, would they be able to to do something that a five-year-old couldn't do, for example? I mean, it's just common sense, right? I mean, it's scientific, like it's not, you know, it doesn't mean that because you are you are at a different stage of development, it doesn't mean you are not a person. I mean, you know, it just it doesn't make sense to me scientifically. Okay, so I see a lot of teenagers. So I run an adolescent medicine clinic. So I see girls who are pregnant. I see those who choose to carry their babies. I see those who choose to abort. So yesterday, yeah, yesterday, in fact, I saw this 16-year-old girl. She, has a very, she had a very stormy childhood. So she, was, she got pregnant and she used to, I mean, she, she was smoking, she was drinking, she was, you know, she has a history of drug use and all that. But when she got pregnant, right, suddenly all that changed. And then she, yesterday when she came, right, after delivery, she brought her one month old with her. And I was like, this girl is amazing. I mean, can you imagine? 16, pregnant, the partner disappeared. The, the father, uh, the parent, or the paternal grandparents don't want to care for the child. Her own mother is scolding her because why do you get pregnant, right? And there she is with this, this one month old. You know, honestly, right? People are amazing, you know, that, I mean, yeah. Okay, so anyway, so there are also the girls who don't, who don't, who get, uh, to get abortions. I mean, um, the one I remember was, the girl wanted to keep the baby. The mom, okay, so the father had died. 
the mom was uh, in a wheelchair. She had one, one, I think, below or above knee amputation. She had renal failure. She was like, how, how, how on earth are we going to take care of this baby, you know? So, so it was a very complicated situation. In the end, uh, the girl had an abortion. She came back, uh, came back to the clinic to see me after that. I think she had mixed feelings. Partly, you know, partly like, oh, if I had a baby, you know, and then partly, well, I'm relieved. It's kind of over. Now I can go back to doing what I was supposed to be doing. It's trying to pass my end levels. So I was actually very affected by that case. So after that, um, I discovered this place called Rachel's Vineyard, which is actually a, a program, a healing space for post-abortion uh, women who are post-abortion. Um, I don't think, maybe not as many people know about this, but actually po abortion itself does cause post-traumatic stress. Uh, you know, it's not... It's not that well known. So I mean, it's not that. It's not that even if you do an abortion, you sort of solve the problem of psychological distress. In fact, when I actually had the privilege of attending one of the retreats at Rachel's Vineyard, um, I, I'm on the board of Catholic Family Life, so that's part of my, part of my work, my volunteer work. So there, I met, I met this whole group of women, who. I mean, they, they, they all had, I mean, there was such a, a different, I mean, a different array of life circumstances. You know, some of them, uh, some of them had the abortion because they were being abused by some, some guy. And yeah, and at that time, they just like, okay, we'll just do whatever he says. Some um, were like, some of the scenarios, you all said like, oh, I'm too young, I can't have the baby now, I, I have my career to think about. Yeah, but in I mean ultimately so so all these women, I mean, when you think about babies, I mean like sister was saying it's it's two people, you know, it's not it's not the mom and her body. It's not the baby. It's the baby and the mom. I mean you genetically test them. They, they are different. I mean, it's not it's not the mother's body. It's I mean, scientifically speaking, the baby has half the father's genes and half the mother's genes. So it's genetically. I mean, the, the thing is different. So I, I don't. So sometimes it's very confusing, you know. Um, yeah. So, so Doctor Ellison, what? yeah, thank you for oh sorry letting us know about Rachel's vineyard. <laughs> Sorry, yes. sorry, very long. Uh, no, no, no should worries. I, sh I should stop here? Uh, no, not calling you to stop, but the opportunity maybe later on to speak personally oh, okay. if uh, Dr. Allison's available to, to, to be around still. Um, yeah, any other, any takers from the floor? Yeah, I'd like to ask Marion. Yes, Nancy, would you like to take the mic? Mic, because you might not be heard, probably not, yeah. Could you share with us uh, how do we make uh, abortion unthinkable? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll speak from two perspectives. You notice that my talk was focusing nothing on religion. Okay. So uh, let's share a little bit from the religious perspective. And this is not purely religious. It is also psychological. It is philosophical. You see... Who among us has never made a mistake before? I think not. But if you've ever made a mistake, you have always come to this question, is there something that I could just press to reset everything? An undo button. You know, when you type on a Word document, right, and you make a mistake, you can easily just press undo, and then everything goes back to normal, or just reopen the previously saved document and everything's gone, right? All the mistakes are gone, you're back to square one. And I think deep down in every human heart, we all long for something that allows us to press reset, to just cancel out whatever has just happened. So this is where, in a sense, faith comes in. Where can we find reset button? It doesn't exist, at least not here on Earth, right? So that's why 
Jesus had to come and give us that reset button. And so at that very deep level, that is a profound affirmation of the culture of life, the incarnation in itself. Now, let's move on to how do we build a culture of life? So in the social space, what can we do? I think something that is not very well understood and emphasized is the role of men. <clears throat> so if you think about it, if in our culture today, if a woman gets pregnant and it's a crisis pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy, what is her natural instinct? What are, what's her natural thought? Oh, abortion. Oh, um, adoption. Oh, this and that, right? But why is it thought of as an unwanted pregnancy, as a crisis pregnancy? And why isn't the immediate solution or immediate thought about, here's a beautiful life, right? And I think the reason why is because we have accustomed ourselves so much to a culture of death. And so in terms of our thinking, what we need to do as a society, first of all, is to advocate, right? For the sanctity of human life from womb to tomb. That's the first step. Another step is to emphasize male responsibility. So for example, in a lot of the cases that we've heard about, we've heard about how men somehow just disappear when the woman gets pregnant. Again, I think we as a society need to come back to re-emphasize, hey, look, you know, when there's an abortion, don't just keep pointing fingers at the woman, right? Especially those who've had abortions. Where's the missing man? You know, and sometimes that man just goes off scot-free, don't know where he is, never heard of him. Last thing, you know, yeah, just the child's father, the, the woman's boyfriend and all that stuff. You don't even know his name. And I think that is something we need to re-emphasize again. How can we as a society emphasize the role of men when it comes to abortion? I think as a wider society, how can we build that supportive community? I think that's the third point I'm going to make. To build that supportive community so that the immediate thought, for example, PCS, right? The immediate thought is, hey, look, here is a pregnancy. I'm pregnant. It's unexpected. It's unwanted, whatever it is. But I know where I can get help, right? There are these loving people out there who will care for me, who will walk with me through this journey, and I know that I'm going to find support. So even if the father of the child doesn't want to take responsibility, I know where I can find support. And I think that is the kind of attitude we want to foster, right? The idea that we are all interdependent, remember, and we are all supporting one another. So can we build that strong village together that we can raise children? And I think that's the role of the church, right? That's where the church comes in. Very uplifting words indeed, Darius. I like that instead of, uh, uh, not instead, on top of sanctity of life, we now have the buzzword culture of life. Thank you for that, Darius. Um, perhaps I could not leave my special guest <laughs> unspoken, um, Mr. Alex. Is there any words that you would like or just feedback on this, um, this talk that you would like to share with us, your own thoughts? Nothing that would put you in your place. In this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I came as a guest. I didn't expect to speak. Um, um, uh, thank you, uh, Darius, for for mentioning um, some of the questions that I had raised in Parliament. Um, in Parliament, there are usually a couple of us who are deemed as pro-life. And I say deemed in, in not the most positive sense of the word. Um, there's myself, there's uh, Chris D'Souza, uh, there used to be uh, Intan, uh, who usually joined us in, in some of these uh, queries that we raised with MOH. To give a little bit of background, uh, I, I'm what you would call a seamless government pro-lifer. So, uh, really from, from conception till death. All elements of life are sacred. So I, I, I not only advocate in terms of uh, looking at reviewing abortion, but also issues such as the death penalty. Uh, and, and that's somewhat uh, a, a different way of looking at, at pro-life issues. Um, I, I would really like to touch on the issue of the question that you raised on how to have a culture of life 
uh, and how to make abortion unthinkable. Um, I have six children. Four are with us, two are with the Lord. And when we lost our first child, it really made us think about why was it that something that we couldn't see or feel because it was so early in the pregnancy, why did it hit us so hard? Why did it have such a great impact on us? It was only eight weeks. Um, and, you know, it happened very suddenly. But it really took everything away from us when the news broke. And we were very blessed to meet a fellow FMDM sister of uh, uh, Sister Jacinta, Sister Florence Wong, who uh, spent a lot of time with us at Mount Alvernia. And with her, we started uh, MOH, uh, not Ministry of Health, but Ministry of Hope. So for five years, we organized what was known as the Mass of Hope for Unborn Children. Uh, and with Sister Florence and also working with Rachel's Vineyard at that time, we did uh, retreats and sort of sessions where we brought together families. And what struck us most was the first session we had, a 76-year-old grandmother came. She came through the door and actually our first reaction to her was, you know, uh, auntie, maybe you came to the wrong, wrong talk. Huh? Uh, uh, the golden circle is downstairs. <laughs> so she said, no, no, this is uh, for uh, the unborn children. Yeah, yeah, yes. So we thought maybe for a family member and such. So she spent the entire day with us, eight hours. At, at the end of the eight hours, we invited everyone to write a letter to a child, whether it was abortion, miscarriage, so and so forth. Everyone had an hour to do it. And then we invited and said, would anyone want to share what you wrote? It's okay if you don't. It's, it's a message between you and your child or your grandchildren, so and so forth. She volunteered. And she shared that when she was 18, uh, because of family circumstances, she aborted her child, was a daughter. And she lived with that trauma from 18 to 76. And it was only in writing that letter that she found some closure, not complete closure, but some closure. So does it affect them? It may not affect them at that moment when the decision is made because it's a practical decision. But it lives with them. At some moment, they'll come back to them and say, what did I do? What would be the child today? Would she have had children and I would have had grandchildren? What would we be talking about right now? So every decision is going to live with us for a long time to come. But coming back to the culture of life, I think we often see abortion today in, through the lens of cultural wars, about a battle between good and evil, about pro-choice, pro-life, all these labels that we have, I don't think they're helpful. Today, in America, there is a case before the Supreme Court, Dobbs versus Jackson. Uh, Dobbs being uh, Thomas Dobbs, he's the Deputy Health uh, Services Officer, and Jackson being the Women's Health Organization in Mississippi there is a chance that the Supreme Court may overturn Roe v. Wade, 1973, the very basis for abortion laws in the US. Would I cheer, cheer that moment? I wouldn't. Because what it has meant is that the issue of life 
and sanctity of life is so politicized through the lens of left, right, liberal, progressive, conservative, hardline, hard right, uh, that no one talks about the child anymore. The, the child is just an excuse to have an argument. So you cannot build that culture through that, that argument, as, as Darius uh, very aptly put it. So for us in Singapore, it's a constant need to remind ourselves, and especially for politicians in parliament, that when I advocate for something, such as a review of the gestational age, I, I, I don't do it through a religious lens. I do it purely through science, through evidence. People may attribute certain reasons as to why I ask, oh, because he's Catholic, because he's known to be pro-life, so and so forth. And that's okay. But on the record, in the Hansard, in Parliament, I have not made a religious argument. I've made a practical, scientific, medically, evidence-based argument. And through that, and it's never about a confrontation, I don't go to Amy and say, you know, why are you like that? Right? We, we, we know beforehand. I ask this question, she'll come to me and say, you know, you've asked this before. You know I can't offer uh, uh, a instant gratification to your question. We will constantly review it. Uh, but I have to give that answer from the perspective of the Ministry of Health. And I understand that. But the conversation must continue. So it must always be there. So every year in the budget, uh, on any other opportunity, I would, I would raise the issues of the sanctity of life. Sometimes it gets answered, sometimes it gets addressed, sometimes it doesn't. But at least on the record, it's said. Uh, the last point I would make is that uh, in the culture of life, it's not just the big things. It's not uh, big speeches, big movements, protests that makes the biggest difference. It's gatherings like these, having people understand the issues from, from an excellent panel, uh, from the, the work of Life Runners that every week gathers to pray. There's something as simple as that. As people see us, as people feel, why? Why would you do this? It's not even your child. It doesn't affect you. It, well, it does affect us. But we do it because we believe in what we're doing. And often when you have decent conversations with even people who are pro-choice, they understand your perspective. You understand theirs as well. And hopefully, through some sense of uh, osmosis, they get to see more and more of where our perspective is. And it should never be from uh, uh, a standpoint of confrontation. Uh, I, I, I leave with one final anecdote. When uh, I had one resident who had two children, and she came to see me uh, to change her child's school. Some of you who perhaps had attended uh, the Caritas talk a couple of months back would have heard this example. Uh, and part of me, uh, in my training, I, realize that you know that's not really what you're here to see me for so as we dwelled a little bit deeper she was pregnant she was expecting a third child uh, and to me I, I congratulated her i said you know i'm very happy for you but she didn't look happy at all um, so we had a private conversation away from everybody else and she said you know my husband doesn't want the third child. I want it. Even, even if it's to hold him or her for one moment, uh, I would want to. But we can't afford it. We really can't. I'm afraid of losing my house, my benefits and such. Uh, I can't. But the community of support, this importance of the culture of life, meant that we could find a support network. I, I, I called Sister Florence, I called everyone I knew at Mall Avenue and said, you know, I have this resident. What can you do for her? Everything was waived. No charges. I called my wife's gynecologist. 
who's at Mount Alvernia as well. She said, no problem. Except for the $300 that you have to pay to NUH for the scan. That one beyond my control. So, okay, $300, that one we can take care. And we went back to her within 24 hours and said, you have that option. It's here for you, and there are people who care for you. And she was happy with that. Unlike Robert Carver, however, there wasn't a happy ending. Because at the end of it all, she was under so much pressure from her spouse, who, you know, I have, I have choice words for him, uh, but as an outsider, sometimes there's very little you can do. You give the option to them, and you hope, you hope that the options work for them. Unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, she stopped contact with us for a couple of weeks. And after the first week, we knew that whatever we could arrange for would probably not work out. But what was so tragic about the situation was because of that, we then realized it wasn't the first time. It was the third child that she had given up on. And it affected her so much. She went into depression, she lost her job. And so the situation that both of them were so worried about that they will lose everything, income, housing, so and so forth, because of the impending birth of a child, came true despite not having the child. So examples like these uh, in the conversations that we have changes perspectives. And it's not the most comfortable of uh, dialogues you can have, but we must have them. And when, hopefully when people see the, the different perspectives, uh, we can make a bigger difference. Uh, we are one of seven countries that allow abortion post 20 weeks. Uh, hopefully, uh, there will be one less soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Alex. And especially for tabling sanctity of life and putting it on the record year after year. Um, yes, I'm getting evil eyes from the organizer because we've uh, sort of uh, <laughs> uh, overstayed our welcome. Um, of course, yes. Um, could you indulge, indulge us for like maybe a minute? Thank you. So I'm uh, Andy. I'm from Natural Family Planning, NFP. Some people think it's National Family Planning. <laughs> it's not. But we help people to understand their body and know when they are fertile or not so that there is, you can avoid the situation of an unplanned pregnancy. And if you realize in the statistics, about 50% of the abortions in Singapore are by married women who could have continued. So the reality is you think about it very carefully for abortion to happen, many things must be there. Uh, unwanted pregnancy, um, a doctor who is willing to perform abortion, a uh, parent or a, a that says go for it, or a, you know, and um, the decision of the man and the woman. So it's really many steps along the way that they could say no, but they do go ahead, also including the law, of course. But, you know, um, for us, it's about education. We need to know and understand what the church teaches. For us Catholics, it's very clear cut. For those without religion to guide them, it can be very difficult to understand, and it may be following what the media tells them, you know, solve the immediate problem, things like that. But we can, as um, Catholics, as um, Ignite and Shine, you know, to be the light to advise the person that we meet that is considering abortion to find answers, to find support. Yeah. So that's the little we can do and you know, educate ourselves and share this news that uh, God is the God of life and they can be supported in their journey. So I'd like to get Bianca to share about Life Runners very quickly so you can join us for prayers or the more. Okay, so I'm representing Life Runners Singapore. Uh, Life Runners is actually from the US. It started there and Life Runners Singapore will be completing 10 years next year. Basically, what we do is meet up every Saturday um, at the park, get vitamin D, and pray the pro-life rosary. And 
for those who are not familiar with the pro-life rosary, we pray um, for mothers, fathers of aborted children. Uh, we also pray for medical professionals, doctors, nurses, as well as for the laws that are currently in existence, as well as for new pro-life laws um, to come into practice. So this is the pro-life rosary that we have. And COVID has been a blessing for many of us because uh, life runners meet up at Bishan Park. And for people like me who live in the East, it's very far. So we do it over Zoom now. So if anybody is interested, um, just come and look for me later. I'll let you all know the details. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone, once again, for turning up. I hope you brought something away from this session. And um, do remember um, the thought process of uh, cultivating a culture of life. And of course, our theme, the sanctity of life. Thanks once again. Good night. <laughs>